morning, family. Good morning, family. If you would, make your way into seats or a place in here where we can get together. I know uh, we're missing quite a few. We left a lot of them at the campsite this weekend. <laughs> uh, quite a few are still there, which is fine. Uh, they're enjoying God's creation out there. We had a good time. We'll tell you more about it later. But uh, for now, let's get our hearts and minds where they need to be, if you would. Rise to your feet and let's pray and let's get in a posture of praise. Father, we ask you to come into this place. We ask you, Lord, to have your way. Precious Lord, open the windows of heaven above this house. Let your glory be poured out. I pray for your anointing, your touch to be upon each and every one on this platform so that, Lord, that we would enter into the place you want us to be in. Father, have your way from beginning to end. And you receive all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe that today, won't you shout amen? <laughs> hey, before we do something. Look at somebody next to you and give them a little high five. Say, hey, it's good to see you. Yeah, just tell them, tell them something nice. Say, hey, you look good. Just tell them. Yeah. Are you ready to praise the Lord today? If you are, say yeah. Y'all ready to love on Jesus this morning? If you guys want to come into the altars or if you want to come into the aisles and let's just praise him, however that looks like, we can clap, we can sing, we can jump, we can dance, whatever you guys want to do this morning. Come and join in the song that the angels sing. Glory to our God in heaven's King. Your mighty name, Lord, we cry like a banner lifted high. For you are great and greatly to be praised. Your throne in your presence is 
you, Jesus. God, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. I love that song so much. Um, Because why wait until heaven to praise him and to worship him, to dance before him and sing before him? Why wait (laughs) when we could do that now? And so I just love that song. Let's just begin to worship him in this place right now. Let's not care who we're beside or what what we may look like. Because if you look at like anybody in the Bible, they they worshiped and they praised the Lord. You you ever heard of David, (laughs) you know? Um, And and the cool thing about David is that uh, a lot of people say that he danced, um, when he became king, he he danced and his clothes fell off, but that wasn't actually the case. He stripped his clothes because when a king does that, it it says that it, it means that he has been defeated by another king. So when he became king, he was praising and worshiping the Lord, going so crazy, he began to strip his clothes saying, I've been completely defeated by the real king. And that's why he was praising and worshiping the Lord so much. And he was just going crazy in the streets and stripped his clothes because he didn't care what he looked like. He didn't care at all because the Lord is God. And he was worshiping and praising him, stripping and saying, you, I've been completely defeated by you, Jesus, by God. And God, we just thank you in this place, God. And God, we want to become more like that and worship and praise God. And you ever heard of Hannah? Hannah prayed and Hannah worshiped so much that no words were coming out. She was sobbing and weeping and worshiping to where all all that was happening was her mouth was just moving. And she looked like a crazy person, but she didn't care. She didn't care. Her husband was like, Hannah, what's wrong with you? And she just kept worshiping and kept praying and kept, kept weeping before the Lord. And no words came out because that's how much she loved God. And that's how much she needed him in that moment. So let's do that this morning. Let's go after him because he is God. He is God, he is God, he is God, he is God, he is God. And no, nothing will change that. God, we lift you high, God. We don't lift our problems high. We don't lift ourselves high in this place. God, in any thought that um, maybe we came in here to look good or we came in here because, you know, that's a good Christian thing to do. God, convict us, God, if that's our posture. Convict us, God, if that's our heart, Lord. God, let us come in here because we can't stop worshiping you, Jesus. But we have been completely, completely aware of who you are as God. God, that we come in this place full of just a heart for you, God, a heart after you, Jesus. And I understand that it can be, maybe it can feel weird to worship and praise him or, or maybe you're just taking those baby steps. He loves baby steps. You know, my God, he loves baby steps. So if you wanna make that baby step today and just give the Lord something different today, give him a sacrifice today. That's um, maybe, maybe even it's, it's different for you standing for the Lord, you know, or kneeling before the Lord or singing out loud or praying to him. Whatever that is, he deserves a sacrifice. Oh God, you're worthy, Jesus. God, you are God alone, Jesus, and nothing will change that, God. And we lift you up, God. We don't lift ourselves up, we lift you up in this place. Thank you, Jesus.
want to see your face, Jesus. God, we're seeking after you this morning. God, we want you, Jesus. God, we ask that you come into the room, Jesus. You come into the room, Lord. see in God's kingdom there are many trees there's the Joshua tree made to be able to stand in the desert but God has not made us so he has not made us children in a dry and weary land he's made us like the willow who can only survive next to the river who can only survive with its roots reaching to the water so you understand we are like trees planted by the waters of the living of the God trees planted by the river of living water so dig in and dig deep. Father, Lord, flow in this place. Let your river pour out, Lord Jesus. Let there be streams of abundant flow in this place. We're not made to thrive on a drop. We're not made to thrive on the tiniest bit in a dry and weary land. But instead, you turn the desert into streams of living water, Jesus. So change us and make this place become a place of such overflow. That it pours out the doors, Lord, and touches the city. Whether they hear our song or not, let there not be anything but a wrecking flow that changes the winds, that changes the life of this place, that changes the heart, Lord Jesus, that brings revival, Jesus. Flood this place, Jesus. Flood it, in Jesus' name.
talk to him. God, we want to touch you this morning. We want to touch you, Jesus.
has come and tasted and see. You taste of the waters of life and of your fullness and of the goodness of the Lord. That when it comes time for harvest, when it comes time for the season, for the fruit to fall from the trees, that all who take and eat of it will rejoice. Jesus, clothe us in your glory. Clothe us in your wonder. Clothe us in your presence. And clothe us in the awe of your name, Jesus. Just to be close to you, to be near to you, to engage with you. And Lord, let us rest in the fire and the warmth and the comfort of your heart and your love. And Lord, even in your discipline, let there be joy. Even in your breaking, Lord, let there be fullness. Because there is no place better than but to be with you, than but to be near you. Lord, let the humble rest in the presence of the cloud we brought low. Lord, let your kingdom be made high. Let your name be exalted throughout all the earth. No one else but you. No one else but you. Jesus, the name above every other name, we praise you and we glorify you today. Jesus, we pray.
grab it the last few Tuesday nights. And just let Caden do his thing. <laughs> and what I love about that is how many of you have slowed down enough this week just to be intimate with, with God? You know, let's be honest. A lot of us, we just, we get busy. And uh, what I love about a moment like this, this morning is an opportunity for us to slow down. Let your mind rest a minute. Rest with the king. You don't have to. And I just got to tell you, I, I, sometimes we worry when we spend time with God that we got to talk all the time. I'm just trying to help somebody in here. You don't have to talk constantly to have communication with God. Okay? I'm just going to tell you, I, I mean, I was in the woods this weekend. I had a million with me for a couple of times, and I went by myself yesterday. And I had a great time with God. And we didn't say, I didn't say a word out loud. And I know he wasn't mad at me about it. Sometimes it's just being quiet, thinking on him, thinking about things, thinking about his blessings, his goodness. And that's what I love. And, and I love watching Kate get caught up in his space because, I mean, what he does here is what he does at home. So, <laughs> right? I mean, that's just it. So my challenge to my family in here is as crazy as life gets don't put so much pressure on yourself about the time that you spend make it quality time where you just focus in slow down and don't do all the talking sometimes it's hard to listen if you're talking the whole time right <laughs> anybody ever feel that way you don't have don't raise your hand but you ever feel that way when you're praying that you feel like you just got to say something and you're worried that, you know, don't do that. <laughs> no, because God sees your heart. Many times in the morning times when I, I spend time in prayer, I, I bring a few petitions to the Lord and then I, I, I lift him up with some praise and things like that. And we just sit sometimes. Sometimes we talk a lot, sometimes we don't. But I know he's there with me and I know it's intimate time because we're focused in. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. Well, you all look lovely today. We're missing quite a bit of our family uh, this morning. We left some of them in the woods. Uh, they're still at the campsite. So, uh, but uh, uh, I don't know if they're caught. I don't think. I think they're 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 headed straight home. Most of them, but uh, sometime midday today. But uh, it was a good weekend. So I believe are the kids leaving? I see some leaving. Or is that? Yeah, did the, I didn't see the, did the thing come up, but anyway, Children's Church is formally dismissed, right? I'm, I'm making sure because I don't see every kid moving, and I'm just making sure. So, okay, yes, Miss Brandy is in the back giving y'all the wave, so y'all can y'all can head that direction. Go and be blessed. Learn about Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is he good? Yeah? <laughs> Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll jump right into offering. If you can tell, as you can tell, Pastor's not here this morning, and uh, we wore him out at camp. He's uh, exhausted. No, I'm really not. Just, for some reason, uh, he's not feeling well. Called me about 10 o'clock and uh, said, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. But uh, he did go to the camp out and had a great time, but uh, I don't think this is related uh, at all. It's something completely different. But uh, he said, barring a miracle, I'm not going to make it. I was like, really? So, uh, but uh, it was good to have him there, though. But uh, that being said, I'm going to dive right into offering today. I do have something to share with you, or the Word, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But uh, let's just continue in a mode of worship as we give to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I just want to jump right into it. If you've got something today on your heart, uh, or a matter of fact, let's do this. Why don't you close your eyes for just a moment? Since we're in an intimate place right now, it's really easy for you to do this. And just say, okay, Lord, I want to give to you. What would you have me give? And maybe the Lord's just saying, okay, your tithes are fine. Or maybe he's giving you a number. Or maybe he's challenging you today. And I want to encourage you to do what he tells you. Whatever that may be. 
Because it's not the amount. It's the heart behind it. So whatever that is, let's go ahead and prepare it now. Let's lift it before the king. Father, we lift these gifts up before you right now. Some have an empty hand. But, Lord, we're trusting and believing in your word and your promises. We ask that, Father, that you would just meet the needs. You know them. And, Lord, they are great in many, many of our households here. And, Father, I just pray that you bless them over and abundantly. And, Lord, those that are maybe struggling, you know the situation. Open the doors. Let your blessings be poured out, Father. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Somebody say amen. The Bible says we're to be cheerful givers. It's now time to give the offering. So come on. got even more empty seats. It's almost like we need to bring the kids back, but <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, uh, it's good to see everybody really is. So uh, uh, give these gentlemen a hand. Aren't they awesome? Yeah. Servants of the King, man. Love those guys. They do such a great job. So uh, so yeah, briefly, just give you a little cap. This weekend was our camp out, and uh, typically it's just a men's only deal, and we do it as a hunting uh, trip, which we still did, but this time we opened up to families, and uh, uh, quite a few were there, and uh, several of us kind of laughed. It was a little different dynamic having ladies running around in the camp, uh, but uh, it, it was it was fun. It was not a bad thing at all. So uh, uh, Miss Elaine is still there with her her ladies, and I think the guys drove back. Uh, David came back with me, and uh, so uh, I'm trying to think who else. Shannon's still there with, uh, and I know Jeremiah, and I think uh, the Snyders are still there, and. It's, Anyway, pastor did his visitation yesterday. It was kind of funny. Uh, I'd come back from hunting, and uh, I was sitting there. He said, well, I made visitation. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, I went to every camp, made sure I visited everybody because I know they're not going to be there tomorrow. I said, well, hey, pastor, good for you. So, uh, but it was fun to see him in that atmosphere because in all the years that I have known him, which is over 30 years, I have never, ever known him to go camping like in a tent, ever. He's even made jokes about it, like, no, if you ain't got a cabin or a camper, I'm not going. Now, Shannon had a camper. He brought his. He, and, no, Pastor, go and pile up in a tent. I said, really? This is going to be interesting. And he did well. And I'm proud of him because I think he tried just about everything that we provided to eat, which, by the way, is quite a smorgasbord of food, uh, especially if you like wild game. There was a lot, including alligator burgers, and pastors seemed to really love those. So, yeah, believe it or not, yeah. He did not try the deer heart. I couldn't get him to do that, but several did. Some liked it, some didn't. But anyway, you had to be there. Uh, it wasn't all that kind of food. There was other food too, but uh, it was it was a good event. So, so I think we'll probably do it again in the future. Uh, I think it would be fun to do just the families, maybe in the spring without the hunting. But uh, Caden had a little success. He he actually got a deer while we were there, and the uh, rest of us just saw him and waved. We didn't get a chance, but uh, was, uh, so he's the only guy, and uh, which which is where the heart came from, by the way, and so. Anyway, more details than you probably wanted, but just wanted to give you a cap so you know that uh, it's fun to get with our church family and do things outside of these walls sometimes, and uh, this was a first, and uh, first we've ever done that, and then uh, several of us guys have done it, and uh, so we kind of laughed at ourselves several times, like, oh, this is kind of different, you know, but uh, it was all good, and I think a lot of the ladies appreciated it because most of us guys did everything. Yeah, because that's what we're used to doing. And uh, so all the cooking and straightening up and everything. And Freddie and I laughed last night, uh, um, Friday night rather. And uh, after everybody left, because they were all in our camp, and uh, for the big meal and everything, and everybody left, and he kinda, we kind of looked at each other and went, 
at this mess. <laughs> Everybody left their stuff there, so we spent the next 15, 20 minutes cleaning up. That's never happened at camp, but it was pretty entertaining. So, uh, But anyway, it was good stuff. And enough, enough on that, but uh, if you want to hear more stories, we'll tell you some later on. But uh, proud of Pastor, though. I was excited that he went, and he did seem to enjoy himself uh, thoroughly. So, so when he called me at 10 o'clock a while ago, I just really kind of panicked because, uh, honestly, my mind was not on preaching the Word today. And uh, I, will, I want you, I, I'm going to bring this straight as the Lord delivered it to me. Uh, it's, it's a random notes scribbled and, and arrows pointing to this and that. And you can thank Sister Joyce for that uh, because she prayed for me and I got to download a moment later and the presence of God met us over there. It was fun. So uh, what we're going to hear today is something I think we all should hear and uh, hopefully it's an encouragement to our hearts. So are you ready for the word today? If you are, say yeah. All right, glad to hear that. So grab your word in your hand. Let's do what we do every week. Rise to your feet momentarily, and let's just do this together. Say this with me. This is the word of God. Everything it says I am, I am. Everything it says I can do, I can do. Everything it says I have, I have. When I hide it in my heart, let it be formed in my mouth. When I speak it in faith, it unleashes the creative power of God that causes me to walk in victory, success, deliverance, healing, and prosperity. All right, somebody say amen, yeah? <laughs> One of these days, we're actually going to change this up and actually, because there's misspelled words and everything on it. I keep pointing it out, but that thing's been there for uh, so many, so many years, and it's pretty fun. Have you ever noticed that? Oh, there's misspelled words and all kinds of stuff. Later, it's kind of comical, actually, but uh, we all read it like it's supposed to be, and all good. <laughs> Proud of all of you. No more problems here. Grab your word. Let's dive in. Matthew chapter five. Matthew chapter five. Let's get into it. This is a section of scripture commonly referred to as the B attitudes. Anybody ever heard that before? This is what I was taught when I was a kid, and just a little random thought. It has nothing to do with my sermon today, but just to give it, give you a pointer here. The B attitudes are actually verse three all the way down to uh, twelve, and uh, or eleven rather. Well, twelve is. It was included when I did this. I had to memorize these, and uh, uh, I was about uh, 10 years old, I believe it was, and uh, at my grandfather's church when I was little, and um, so I had to memorize them. I was the only person in my Sunday school class that memorized them, and I had, I, I was, I had to do it in front of the entire church. Uh, they gave us like two weeks to do this, and I had a little red uh, Gideon's New Testament. Y'all seen those? That was my Bible at the time, and I was reading every night, Matthew chapter 5, and I was memorizing those scriptures. And uh, so when it came the day of presentation, I got to get up in front of the entire church after I did it at Sunday school because I had to do it for the Sunday school director. And so I quoted them all off, and he said, man, that's fantastic. All right, you got to do it in front of the whole church, though. What? So I had to get up in front of the church and did it. I was a nervous wreck. I was a little kid. Everybody was staring at me, obviously. And uh, so I quoted them off, and uh, they handed me a Bible that was monogrammed with my name on it. And I still have that Bible, believe it or not. It's a little blue uh, uh, Bible at the house. It says Marcus Shoemaker on the bottom corner of it. And I still have it. I don't hardly ever use it anymore because I've got this big fancy one that my wife bought me. When we were dating, by the way, still have that one. So, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, the Beatitudes are a good um, uh, a guide for life. I want to encourage you to do the same as I did at 10 years old. Memorize them. Go through and read them and uh, commit them to your heart. We're actually going to read a little bit of it, uh, but, and then we're going to dive right into the next section of Scripture directly behind that. So if you're in Matthew chapter 5 now, let's go ahead and uh, I'll dump, jump to 19 because this is the final, uh, on the final stretch of the Beatitudes. It says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12 is one that I committed to memory as well and something that carried me through once I got saved uh, at 15 when I was in high school. It says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. This was something that I made sure that I committed. 11 and 12, and I'll read 11 again. Bless are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. You shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, just to put it out there for, 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 for uh, just so you know, in high school, I was very open about my faith as I am now, and there were many times when people criticized. Other teenagers would make fun of me and thought I was, you know, this and that, and of course, a lot of them knew my past. How many of you got a past? And when people like to bring up the past, right? And then, but 
I never forget the first time this scripture came alive inside of me was in a classroom, and I had a guy who was sitting next to me who was, I thought, was a Christian. I mean, he was a guy to talk to talk, but all of a sudden I said something about it, and he began to mock me and made fun of me because, because, uh, uh, and I think it had something to do with the fact that I went to a full gospel church and he went to a Baptist church. I think it had something to do with it, if I'm not mistaken. He began to make fun of me in front of uh, everybody. And I looked at him and I started laughing because this word of God began to well up inside of me. Are y'all hearing me? Let, oh, no, y'all don't understand. I was sitting in class. He was sitting next to me. And he started making fun of me. And I went, what? <laughs> I started laughing. And he said, what, what is wrong with you? I said, you don't understand. I'm just laughing. Yes, obnoxiously, yes. I was laughing obnoxiously. I'm looking at him. Everybody else is looking, what are you laughing? I said, oh, this is great, man. Just keep them coming. I, I need this. I really need this. What are you talking about? I said, oh, by, oh, I'm sorry. Bible says rejoice and be glad. Oh, and by the way, it also says blessed are you when people persecute for Jesus. I said, so I need all the blessings I can get. So keep them coming. What else you got? <laughs> all right, I'm done with you. No, now you missed the point. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? The word of God rose up inside of me, and I was in uh, uh, with the 10th grade at the time, and, and just began to well up. And so since then, that has been my approach ever since. Because when somebody begins to criticize me or, or say something, I'm just like, hey, thank you for the blessings. I appreciate that. That's fantastic. How many of you know you got to have a little bit of tough skin out there to be Jesus freak, huh? You really got to be one with tough skin if you're going to be in ministry. We got real quiet quick right there. You do. You got to learn how to let things roll off because it's going to happen. People are going to say things funny. People are going to say things sideways, and you're going to be like, ah, you know, hey, listen, we're human beings. But that's my setup, so hold those thoughts, and let's dive into the Word here and see where we're going. I'm going to read 12 again. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Here we go. Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. I love the example here as the scripture says, if you're not salt, you're sand. Everybody got that? Looks the same. Don't taste the same. Somebody say amen to that. So when I read this scripture right here, something popped out to me that I had never seen before. Let's read it again. You are the salt of the earth. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to the disciples who are also, am I a disciple of Christ? Am I talking to Christians today, Emma? If you're a Christian today, you just, go, just go ahead and say amen right now so I know. Okay, so I'm talking to Christians today. So Jesus is talking to Christians today, and this is what Jesus says. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor. Hold on. Did you see the word? Did you notice that it says his savor? You ever notice that in the King James Version of Scriptures? Now, can I tell you, I have read this verse, I have quoted this verse, and I've done it wrong for years. I've always said it. Watch this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salt? Now, is salt a him or a her? No. What are we talking about? Jesus was speaking far in advance and understanding. We have to have his savor in our life. And you say, what is a savor? I'm glad you asked. I got a definition for you. Quality in a substance that is perceived by the sense of taste or smell. That is savor. Are you with me? So he is saying here, if we have lost his savor, his, his seasoning in our life, you ever thought about it like that? This weekend we cooked all kind of great food, and we seasoned a lot of it. Was it good by itself? Well, yeah. Was it better with seasoning? Absolutely. And salt was included quite often in that. I cooked quite a bit. A little sprinkle here, sprinkle there. I got all kind of seasons in there. I just go for it, right? Make it, make it. We just get creative. Some, some might taste different than others, but we don't care. We're just having fun. I mean, swing it in there. But a savor. There's something about us that should be seasoning the world. And what I love about the terminology with salt is salt will radically change something, will it not? 
I mean, it will radically change everything in the atmosphere. Uh, when you're going to taste something, you put some salt on it, it's like, whoa. Now, I, my oldest girl, I, I laugh at her. She salts everything before she ever tastes it. And I've been teasing her about this since she was a teenager. I'm like, babe, why do you need it? Th-? I know it does. <laughs> How much you go? Put? <laughs> if she can't see snow on it, she's not eating it. I'm like, what are you doing? So anyway, I tease her about it all the time. It's, it's, it's you know, don't worry. She won't get mad if you run back and go tell her, that Dad was making fun of you. But that's just the way she wants to season a little bit. So I'm hoping that's prophetic. About uh, That's what I'm really hoping. She wants to jump out there and season the world. Praise Jesus. Let's look at it. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? How will we salt the world if we've lost his savor, if we've lost his seasoning in our life? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. If we are not in a place where we are seasoning the world, we are sand. We are just as good as being walked upon. Y'all with me? If you ever, I don't know if you've ever had any salt that didn't have any t- taste to it. I, I don't know. I've never had any like that. But it's got to be interesting. Doesn't happen, right? Interesting terminology that Jesus uses, right? <laughs> so, let's read a couple more verses. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If you believe that, say amen. What I find fascinating about this bit of scripture, this is Jesus giving instruction. And he is saying, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus is, you all said you were Christians a moment ago. It got quiet all of a sudden. Did y'all forget? You Christians, right? Oh, okay, okay. So you are a light. And according to this, you have been set on the side of a hill. You are not hidden from the world. Your light is being seen whether you want it to be seen or not. Your light is on. Your light was turned on the moment you said, Jesus, I give you my life. Now, you might be thinking, well, I don't want to be one of those guys. This really doesn't matter. Your light is always on. You were taken from a lower elevation to somebody who was just full of salt, I mean, uh, sand and just blending in, to elevated to a place where you now have the ability to season and change atmospheres and change people's lives. But your light that's in you was put on the side of a mountain. You are seen by everybody and anybody who's around you all the time. Are you listening? All the time. Your light does not go off. This is something the Lord charged inside of my spirit. Your light does not go off. The moment you said, I love Jesus, the moment you said, I am a Christian, your light was turned off. So my question to you is, if your light is on, what does everybody see? What are they looking at? Come on now. I'm getting somewhere. Just hold on with me. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Verse 16 is fascinating to me, and you don't want to know why. Because when I've read 16 in the past, I've always looked at it as implied like when you do good works. Right? Do you know what I'm saying? Let's look at it, and I'll, I'll explain. It says, let your light so shine before men. And it does not say that when you do good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I've always read that as we want to be out there, but when we do things, people should see it. But when I read this this morning, the light bulb went off in 16. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. It is implied by Jesus Christ himself that we will be doing good works. We will be. Once again, your light is always on. Does not get an off switch. It's on all the time. When the last part of this verse is my favorite part, and I'll read the whole thing again. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That they will see it and they will glorify your Father in heaven. 
Your light should not be glorifying you, but should be pointing those to Father God. Are you with me? So the question tonight and today is, as the Lord was showing this to me, is we have got to walk with the mindset that we are constantly in a dark place and our light is shining for all to see. And it's not an exception in here for good works. Well, I don't have to do that. No, you have to. This is Jesus saying you will be doing it. It's part of the job title. Are you with me? You can't be Christian and no good works. Doesn't make sense. Right? Can't be Christian and no light. Nope, mm -mm, that doesn't work either. Can't be Christian with no salt. Because you're sand at that point. Right? And everybody just loves sand, don't you? Don't you love going to the beach, get sand in your shorts? It's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's, it's not pleasant. Let's don't be sand. Let's be salt. I worry, and I'm going to go now into, uh, I warned you all ahead of time I had to read through my scribbles here as I'm going through. Okay, Psalm. There we go. Psalm 34, 8. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blesses the man that trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Now, what does that got to do with? Well, it has everything to do with it. Think about the salt and the taste. Our job is to salt this world. But this is my concern for the church today and my family in this place. When the scripture, when David is saying in here, taste and see that the Lord is good. I worry that the world cannot get a chance to taste and see that God is good because Christians have put a bad taste in their mouth. Y'all with me? See, our light should not be deferring people away. It should be pointing them up, right? That's what Jesus said. But y'all know. The great thing about Jesus and, and salvation is, is what? Grace. We have grace over faulty human beings. But it gets twisted oftentimes by the church as a whole. And they just live in that and think that there's nothing, no consequence to it. I don't know about you, but I want to populate heaven. I'm praying right now that every year they're kicking another wall out and adding some rooms because of me. If that is not your heart today, I'm challenging you to go back to look at the scriptures and see what Jesus said about you. Not what I'm saying, what Jesus is saying. The church has a reputation for, for doing some things that are probably not the best. 1 Peter 2, 3, and we're blessed in this house because we don't necessarily fight a lot of these, although some of them do creep up from time to time. <laughs> but 1 Peter 2, 3. As soon as I find it, I had all of my verses marked but that one. There it is. 1 Peter 2, 3 says this. And this is Peter also taking the same terminology. And uh, I'm going to read 2. It says, the newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Verse 3, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, let's back up a little bit. How many of you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? He's done good things for you, right? Probably more than you deserve. Can somebody say amen in here? Yeah? This is what the world needs to see, do they not? This is what they should be tasting. When they look at the church, this is what they should be seeing. They should be seeing people that have a light that is shining, saying that my God is good. He tastes good. Come and see what I have tasted. This is good stuff. This is life-changing stuff. But oftentimes we as a church, we get a reputation for having some gossip issues, right? People like to talk. They like to say this, like to say that about this one and that one. We, we have a reputation, and, I'm, and I don't mean this specifically for this church, but I mean as a whole. That we criticize people for their clothing when they come into the place. We might push somebody off to the side because maybe they got tattoos. Funny story, this weekend we were at camp, and an older gentleman uh, picked up Jeremiah because uh, Caden was still in the woods, and he brought him back to, to camp so Jeremiah could get the truck and go back because uh, Caden was, uh, I think, going to get his deer and everything. 
And so when they pulled up to camp, Donna was standing there, and, he, and, and the elder gentleman looked over at her and said, you with this church group too? Because Jeremiah had told him he was there with the church group. She said, yeah. Well, how did he let you in with all them tattoos all over? Who gave this man that impression that Jesus was like, no, you got a tattoo, you can't get in heaven? Somebody along the way did that. Somebody gave him the wrong impression. And I love Donna's response. She looked at me, she said, uh, because I'm forgiven? <laughs> no need to add anything to that one, right? And we are all forgiven. And we walk in a place of grace. But our challenge is, of course, what do we do going forward with this light that we have? And I love that because <laughs> you got to know Donna. She's like, because I'm forgiven? Like, hello. It was almost like dummy. But that's not what she said. It was just that, that tone. Uh, but, <laughs> but we have a tendency oftentimes to we find, that we find fault in one another as a church as a whole. And that, that, that goes along with this whole thing. We look at others and we're quick to cast judgment because they're not in church on a Sunday because they had something else going or because they, they, they relate this and they miss this. And why do we do that? That's not shining a light. It's criticizing our own. Once again, we don't need to give the world a bad taste. We need them to taste and see. Are y'all with me today? And we do that, don't we? We have it says, I'm grateful, I'm grateful that in here that we don't do that. But I'm going to give you an example. And this will go as far as somebody saying something to you. Anybody ever got a phone call from somebody wanting to complain about somebody else in the church? Maybe, maybe a complaint about pastor or me, me. How many of you have ever got a call or a complaint about me? Come on, Tina, lift, lift your hand. Praise Jesus. My sister, okay, my family's like, whoo, glory, they got two hands. Okay. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm good with that. But I try to learn from it if I can. I've gotten better, praise Jesus, but I am still growing. But I'll never forget as a teenager, I was at Pastor David's house. And I was probably too comfortable at their house, I guess. But I answered the phone because it rang, and I happened to be standing next to it. I mean, I'd been around for years, right? I mean, I answered the phone. I would answer and call whoever. I answered the phone. There's a brother in the church. And he said, man, I'm glad. Where's Pat? I said, well, he's in the other room. He's behind me. He says, man, I need to talk to you. We got, and he began to vent to me and explain to me all of his displeasure about Pastor David. And he did. He began to say a few things. I said, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. And he's like, but you, but you know the scripture says, hey, you need to stop. Whoa, what, what? I'm a teenager. This is a grown man. He's twice my age. He was well into his 40s, and, uh, 50s or so. And I got to understand, I'm a teenager. That's old at that point, right? Now I'm 47 going, that guy wasn't old at all. All right, so, but, but I was like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He said, what, 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 what you got, brother? What you got? Because he thought I was fencing the child because I'm not about to agree with that. I said, hey, uh, I'm not a garbage can. I do not need garbage dumped into me. Well, I, I, I said, so you know what? We're not, we're not going to have this. As a teenager, well, I, I, I said, you want to talk to him? You have to talk to him later. That was it. I was a teenager. <laughs> Family, we got to let our light shine, but we also got to understand when people dump garbage inside of us, it does taint our light because here's the problem. Most of the time when people call you to tell you something and you know the difference between gossip and a prayer chain. When somebody's calling about prayer, they don't give you the details. Hello, talking to somebody probably in here. I don't know that for sure, but I could be. When somebody says, hey, we need to pray about so-and-so, this, this is going on, that's it. But the ones that want to gossip call up and say, well, you know this happened, this happened. Well, you know this is going on. You know the difference. Hello. This is what gives the world a bad taste about Christians. We look like we're exclusive, like we're over here, like we're high and mighty and everybody else is below us, right? And oftentimes it's because we, we disguise our prayer uh, requests, under, uh, we, we disguise our gossip under that. And I'm going to help somebody in here. If you ever know somebody who has a problem with gossip, they are, have an insecurity problem. They have a need to know thing going on inside of them. They're battling insecurity. So now you know how to pray for them when they call you. 
So hold up, hold up, let me pray for you. And you just begin to pray and cast out that demon of insecurity out of them because apparently they're hurting from that, right? They don't know who they are in Christ. They have a need to run and tell this information because it gives them a gratification. It makes them feel better about themselves. Are you with me? Right? And we have that problem at, in the church. This is why people don't like to come to church. Maybe that's why some of them aren't here today. I don't know. I don't know of anything. I'm just saying. But we are supposed to be giving the world a taste, an example, so that they can come and see how good this God has been to us. Let's be cautious, not about necessarily always about what we're doing, but also about what we're receiving. When someone calls my, when, and they give me the call or they text or whatever, I am really quick to, listen, to pay attention to the details. Are they gossiping or are they prayer? And I will cut them off. And I can promise you this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help somebody in here too, by the way. I just need to say this. I'm going to ask a question. Has anybody in here ever in your entire life of knowing me, some of y'all know me a long time, ever heard me say one critical statement or word or anything criticizing our pastor? Can I go ahead and tell you, I don't always agree with him. I don't always like him either. And he don't always like me. But you'll never know. Because frankly, it's none of your business. And I'm going to th throw something else in here just for fun. I'm just, I'm having fun at the moment. Y'all, y'all, you know, he knows, we've talked about this and laughed about this. We've had disagreements, believe me. And I'm usually wrong, but we've had disagreements, praise God. But speaking of being wrong, let's talk about my, my awesome wife over here. Has anybody ever heard me say anything critical about her? Have I ever been mean? Have I ever downed her? Have I ever called you complaining? And you never will. When I was early in my marriage, I'm getting to a point now. I'm not doing marriage counseling now. Hang on there, okay? When I was early in my marriage, I was a young guy. I was 20 years old, and I was working as a carpenter's helper out, and uh, there's a bunch of guys there, and we were just talking. And the one guy said something about his wife, and he was complaining about this or whatever. She this and that or whatever. And the other guy said something else, and I got to looking at him, and I thought, hmm. And I'm just listening to him. Well, one of them had the audacity to ask me if I had the same problem with my wife. So what are you talking about? Well, you know, this and that. I said, oh, no, uh-uh. Well, oh, come on now. We know, you know. I said, no. And I'm going to go ahead a little bit further, too. I don't criticize her. I don't get into the let's gossip about our spouse business with other people. I don't compare notes. As far as you all know, I married the best woman that God could have ever gave me. And that's all you will ever know. Is she perfect? Heck no. Well, maybe no. I shouldn't say heck no, babe. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. You know? She's not. And I said that on purpose as a joke because I knew she was good with that. But she'll tell you the same thing about me. But what I love about her and that, have you ever heard her say anything critical or ugly about me? Nope. And you never will. Now, unless you're in her inner circle, and there's about two people on that list, maybe three, that will hear something worse, where, but she's also very careful about how she words things because she don't want to say it the wrong way. Now, I'm teaching you something right here without you even knowing it. The scripture is clear on this. Watch this. Let's go right now together. We're going to Philippians. And this was my whole point. Chapter 2. There, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Verse 3, here's where it gets interesting. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lovingness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. That is a letter to the church. And it's also a letter to you, husbands and wives. Are you listening today? 
We have instructions right here about how we're supposed to treat one another in the church. And if we do that also, we would have a whole lot less divorces in our families and our, mar- and our church families out there if we would take the scriptures and the instructions. When I got home late last night, much later than I wanted to, I came home and I didn't even unpack the truck. I wanted to come in and see my wife and visit a minute because I know she was tired. She was waiting up for me, poor thing. It was about 11 o'clock, wasn't it? Something like that. It wasn't huge late. I've been later than that. And uh, this morning, I had a brilliant idea. I said, hey, I got an idea. She said, what is it? And, you know, when I say that, she never knows what that's going to mean. You know, that could mean anything. I said, how about this afternoon? You get out. Go. She said, that is a good idea. So do not call my wife this afternoon to complain about me. She's not answering. She's going out on her own to do whatever she wants. I don't care. And go however long. I don't care. I put no rules on that. When it's time for her to go, let's just go. Go till you're ready to come back. If that's midnight tonight, so be it. I don't care. Because I know when she, she needed that a week ago. I'm a week late, by the way, but I had a camp out and this other stuff. It was crazy, right? So I am trying to esteem her needs above mine. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, that's a teachable moment. Don't clap for that because that makes it look like I'm looking for applause. I don't. I appreciate that, though. It's a good point, but I'm not looking for that. You know, I know your point. You, you weren't seeing it that way. But that, my point is this. That's how we should look at our brothers and sisters in this place. So that we begin to look at one another in a place where we're not criticizing, that we're not critical, that we're not constantly looking for fault or information being passed around, that we are looking to bring them up so that our light begins to shine in a place where others can come and see, as the Scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Your light is on all the time. And yes, it's on in your marriage too, believe it or not. Your Christianity shines It's part of who you are, no matter where you're at. Are y'all with me today? Are you with me? Let me make sure that I have not missed anything. Nope, that was my final thought. This was just a download that I got from the Lord. So it is an encouragement, I hope, to all of us in this place. As we go forward as a family, I know this. Just as my wife admitted a moment ago, I am not perfect, and I know that you are not either. Okay? Some of you... Put on a good show, but we know better. You're a human being. But we're going to love you, and we're going to help you walk and get closer to the Lord as you, as you walk this thing out. But please remember, as the Lord was shining, showing this to me, it's his savor. That quality time with him is where we get his seasoning to begin to be the people we're supposed to be, to salt and bring change to the world. Y'all with me? It's him. And let's be mindful as we go forward and use wisdom with what we hear and what we communicate. Don't get lost in the worldly banter when people begin to criticize televangelists or their wives or their husbands, whatever the case may be. Let's don't do it. I don't even get into those conversations. Yeah, I have my own opinions about some of the televangelists. I'll be honest with you. I don't know. But I'm not saying it publicly, and I won't get into those conversations with other people because of the same reason. Y'all with me now? I would love for this place to be a place where when people walk through this door, they do not feel like all eyes are on them. And I love that so far that we're good about that. But we want to be that kind of people. But when somebody does have to share some business and say, hey, I need to get this off my chest, that they know it's in safe hands and it doesn't need to be communicated to somebody else. Let's create an atmosphere in here going forward as believers in Christ, that when somebody comes in here, it is 100% truly a hospital for the soul, that when people come here, they get healing, they get deliverance, they get everything that they need, because the word ministry, do you know what the word ministry actually means? Meeting needs. We want to meet the needs of the people. And I will be honest with you, based on these scriptures, and I believe it wholeheartedly, the number one need is for people to taste and see that the Lord is good without getting a bad taste in their mouth because of Christians. Amen? Yeah. And y'all know some of them Christians. Not in here, though, right? Right? Does it make sense today? I hope so. It made sense in my mind when I was writing it down. (laughs) I did not proofread or anything. It just went with it. So I believe the Lord has spoken what he wants to speak today. And so let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. 
Lord, I believe that this word is just a, a challenge and also a reminder to all of us. Because, Lord, we're, we're all Christians in here. Right in here, claim to be a believer. And I know that because I know them all. Lord, I pray for my family in this place and even those that are not here today. Because, Lord, I'm going to be honest with you. And I want to say this, Lord, if you'll forgive me during prayer to say this in front of my family in here. I am totally okay with the people staying at camp and not coming to church today. And pastor is too. We're not mad at anybody about that. And, Lord, I know you're not either. Because they are doing what Scripture says. They are together, enjoying one another. And they're bringing glory to you. So, Father, let us get to a place where we are constantly shining our light so that those around us can see that you are good and that the people of God are good because they love you. Father, I want this place, this place to be such a hospital for the soul. Draw us into that place of intimacy, Lord, so that we can know discernment between what's gossip and what's an actual prayer need. And learn to cipher through the details. Precious Father, I ask in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord. Somebody say amen. Simple word today, I believe, yeah? But now, and I want to say that again, too. I have no problem with those folks staying at camp. None whatsoever. I am not offended. I don't, I'm not sitting there, oh, what are they doing? They're skipping church at camp. Yeah. Who cares? I'm, I'm good, totally good with that. They're doing what Scripture says. If you think about it, they're together. Breaking bread and enjoying it, and they're out in God's creation. I'm fine with that. I don't. You'll find that I'm not one of those. I love for people to be in church, and I want you to be here as much as possible. But I'm not one of those over spiritual people that thinks, "Oh my God, they're not in church." Listen, you go on vacation, go on vacation. If you don't want to go to church on Sunday when you're on vacation, that's fine. We try to go, but it's okay if you don't. God's not mad at you, and neither are we. If you're going away on the weekend anniversary trip or you're taking your family on vacation, go do it. It's all good. I used to miss a few time to time for soccer tournaments when I was coaching soccer. We did devotions out of the field. Brought Jesus onto the field. Are we good? I'm telling you something right now. I'm piggybacking on my sermon. Did you all see it? So that we're not looking down on everybody else and going, why are they not here? What are they? No. Because I'm not. But I do want to encourage you to reach out. If somebody's missing today, let them know you missed them today. You know what I mean? And watch your tone, too. Don't be all crazy. <laughs> it makes sense? Anyway, I love you all. I, I appreciate your attentive today. Please pray for Pastor. Hopefully he is feeling better at this point. And it was just a small bug. It's out of the way. And uh, we'll pray for our family that is traveling home later today, that they will have a safe journey. And that uh, we will see them next week or Wednesday night, whatever the case may be. Some may be at prayer on Monday, I believe. So um, am I missing anything else? I did not go over the announcement list, but I, you might want to grab your bulletin if you haven't already. Yes, ma'am. I think she changed that. She's not in here now. She told me that she didn't have to now. I, I do have it written down here, but I think Amy was going to meet, but she changed her mind. And if... Yeah, she's, I thought she told me that a minute ago, making sure that didn't change back. <laughs> so, okay. Everybody good? Grab somebody on your way out. Look at them straight in the face. Say, man, I'm glad you're here. All right? Look at, them, look at them. Tell them something nice about themselves. All right? Love you all. Have a great Sunday afternoon. We will see you next week.